So our next speaker is uh, Alessio Velenkia uh, from University of Tübingen. Um, uh, he's going to talk about the influence of uh, cosmological expansion in local experiments. Please, Alessio, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So let me uh, start by thanking the organizers for this, uh, for organizing this uh, great event. And as it was said, I will speak about the work on the influence of cosmological expansion in local experiments. In particular, this is a work that I've done in collaboration with Felix Pengler and Daniel Brown in Tübingen and Dennis Retzel in Bremen. So let me start with the figure that you already have seen. Uh, that is a picture that uh, probably all of you know and love and that we usually use in uh, outreach events when we want to uh, somehow explain uh, the expansion of the universe. That is the balloon analogy. And in the analogy, the universe is the surface of this balloon. And on the balloon, you can draw galaxies or spot, and then you can inflate it. And you will see that the galaxy will start to recede one from the other, which is in agreement with what we actually observe. And we know that this, the universe is currently expanding. However, if you draw stuff on the balloon, also these will start to expand. And this is not actually on point. And indeed, already in their book uh, on gravitation of Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, they were proposing to do the same analogy, but gluing pennies on the balloon. Because if you do, if you glue a penny, the penny, of course, will not change its size. And more uh, towards the analogy, the rubber of the balloon that is below uh, the the penny, it is glued together with the penny, will not expand together with the rest of the universe, the balloon. And this is, again, is in line with what you observe because we see that the universe is expanding, but we don't see a uh, local structure expanding together with the universe. And this also raises the question, uh, if it is actually possible to see or to experience any effect of the cosmological expansion at local scales. And this question is actually very old. It goes back to, uh, first attempt by Einstein and Strauss in the 40s, uh, in which you were developing this vacuum solution. So essentially putting together a Svarchi solution with a cosmological one, with a Freeman Robertson Walker one after a certain radius. And in this model, the answer to the question was no. Uh, the observer that is inside of the vacuum is in Svarchi, so it doesn't have any idea about the cosmological expansion locally. Uh, however, the discussion has become a lively debate in the years. Uh, and I suggest if you want to read more about this topic to look at this uh, review of modern physics of Carrera and Giulini of 2010. Uh, and there have been uh, a sort of a consensus going toward the fact that yes, we should be able to have some effect of the global cosmological expansion locally. However, there is uh, no agreement on what is the side of this effect usually and if we can actually see them uh, at a certain point. So what we have done in our work, the objective was, again, to go back to this problem, look at very local experiment and which kind of effect we can expect from the cosmological expansion, motivated by, in particular, the rapid development in the field of optic, optical clocks and measurement of frequency. So let me start to dig a little bit more in detail into this problem. and. The first step here is defining a model. So if we were living in an ideal world, uh, I could take Earth, solar system, local galactic environment, and so on and so forth, put it in a, a stress energy tensor and solve Einstein equation. Clearly, we cannot do that. Uh, and so we have to resort to some approximation. And in the end of the game, physics is also the art of approximations. And the approximation that we use in our work is to consider the MacVitti space-time. The MacVitti metric is given here in isotropic coordinate, and essentially it describes uh, a spherically symmetric non-rotating object that is immersed in a Freeman robertson walker expanding cosmological space-time. Uh, and you can see it already from the form of the metric, because if you look asymptotically far away from the central object, you will recover uh, Freeman robertson walker metric, if we are very close to a central object, we are essentially in Schwarzschild. And we can also fix uh, the Hubble parameter to be a constant. So we just have a cosmological constant. And then we are 
back in Schwarzschild, the sitter space time. So this is the model that we use. And now the second step is define what I mean by a local experiment, which kind of local experiment we look at. And the main experiment or the main system that we look at in our work is a simple optical resonator. So think of it as two mirrors that are attached to a solid rod. And then you take this rod and you bring it around with you on your spacecraft around in your curved space time, following a certain trajectory. It can be uh, a geodesic or not a geodesic trajectory, of course, because you have an engine. So uh, what happens when, when you do this? Well, due to the acceleration and tidal forces in going around here, uh, this rod will be deformed and the uh, radar distance between the mirror will change in any case. This will give rise to a frequency shift with respect to the frequency uh, in inertial motion in flat space time. And this problem was actually considered in detail by Dennis and collaborators in this paper of 2018. And we use these results by looking in particular to different observer. In particular, we look at the cosmological observer that is essentially following the Hubble flow, the Kodama observer, which somehow is a bit more physical for us in the sense that is almost a stationary observer, is at the constant area radius from the central object. And I say almost because McVitie in general is not a stationary in space time. However, the Kodama observer is the closest thing that you can find to uh, the time like killing vector of Varchi space time. And finally, there is the geodesic observers that are the one that are in free fall. Now, uh, let me just one second explain what you can see in this formula, and then I will discuss a couple of results. So, uh, as I say, this formula gives you the frequency shift in the frequency resonance of the uh, optical resonator. And most of the parameters that appear here actually are of geometrical origin. Actually, I should go back here. Uh, beta and sigma just define essentially the distance between the end mirror and the center of mass. The center of mass is where you can perform uh, a local frequency measurement. Uh, and then there is the speed of light, of course, and the speed of sound that encodes the elastic property of the rod. It depends on the material, of course. Each material will respond in a different way. Finally, we have the geometrical quantities that are uh, the proper acceleration and this component of the Riemann tensor, where J is the direction in which this uh, rod is oriented. And they are defined in the proper detector frame that, as the name says, is the detector frame that you should choose to describe the experiment. And physically speaking, the proper detector frame is just bringing around with you a clock and the system of three orthogonal gyroscope. And this gives a non-rotating reference frame, which mathematically is obtained by essentially Fermi Walker transporting a tetrad along the time-like trajectory of your observer. Okay, so now we have our formula. And here I can discuss some of the results that we find. So if we consider a cosmological observer, we see that the cosmological expansion uh, contributes to this, to this frequency shift with terms that are linear in the Hubble parameter. And this would be good because the Hubble parameter or the Hubble constant, if you want, is uh, something like 10 to the minus 18 second to the minus two, uh, second to the minus one, which is kind of clear to the kind of frequency precision that we can reach with optical clocks. However, if you go to more, let's say, physical observer, in the sense observer for which you don't necessarily know already that the universe is expanding and you are not actually already following the Hubble flow, like the Kodama observer or freely falling observer, then what we find is that corrections are always quadratic in the Hubble parameter. So they are way smaller than in the case of the cosmological observer. Same story, if you consider a slightly less local experiment, still local, but not as local as the optical resonator, uh, that is the case of double Doppler tracking. Uh, in this case, what you do usually is that you are here on Earth, you send this light signal to a faraway uh, spacecraft, the spacecraft reflects it, and you register the frequency when it comes back. And then you can confront, uh, compare the two frequencies uh, which will have, of course, the effect of the gravitational redshift in these two pieces of the trajectory, plus some 
relativistic Doppler effect due to the relative velocity of the spacecraft with respect to your observer field. Now, also in this case, changing the observer changes the result because different observers define different notion of frequency. But also in this case, uh, apart from the cosmological observer for which indeed there are correction uh, due to the expansion of the universe, uh, that are linear in the upper parameter, for the Kodama and the geodesics, again, uh, the correction are quadratic. And here I'm arriving towards my last slide. So let me give you some estimate, first of all. Uh, first of all, the Hubble constant currently has a value of 10 to the minus 18 seconds to the minus one. Now, if you take a resonator that is 10 meter long in a geodesic motion, so in frame fall, uh, made by aluminum that has a high speed of sound, then you will see that the effect of the cosmological expansion, the frequency shift is something like 10 to the minus 42, which is clearly outside our possibility currently. If instead you consider a gravitational redshift experiment in which you take the sun as your central object and something as far as Voyager 1, and you also consider that you have clocks and so frequency standards at uh, the 10 to the minus 19 uncertainty uh, over a time of 100 seconds, which is kind of realistic, then we can put an upper bound on H0 square. Essentially, we see if you don't see anything that deviates from general relativity in, let's say, Svarch's space time, then you can put an upper bound. And the upper bound is 10 to the minus 29 seconds to the minus two, which is Several order, seven order of magnitude away from H0 square, the current value. So it's not a useful upper bound, but still not as far as these 10 to the minus 42. So here I have my conclusion. To answer to the question, can one see the effect of the expansion locally? The answer is yes, but actually no, in the sense that yes, there are effects, also on very local experiment. The effects are somehow small when you consider physical observer. But until now, what I've discussed was plenty relativistic, but there was essentially no quantum in it. Uh, so the hope is that adding quantum to the mixture, so using, for example, quantum metrology and uh, quantum uh, state of light, we could get better results than what we have right now. But for now, this is my conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alessio, for your talk. So uh, we have time for one short question. Okay, Michael, go ahead. Um, I was wondering um, how how this can be that there's a, a local effect of the uh, of the expansion, given that in the um, in an exact solution the Einstein Einstein Strauss um, solution where you have some Schwarzschild like interior attached to an external exact Friedman universe. In this case, you wouldn't see anything within this um, empty region around the um, Schwarzschild um, object inside this, this hole. So why is it that in your case, you, you are able to, to see an effect? Well, the, the most direct question, the most direct answer is that we are using McVitie spacetime, which is a solution of Einstein equation for a certain stress energy tensor. Uh, which is different from, from essentially using the, the vacuum solution of, uh, of uh, Einstein, because in that case it really was putting together, as you say, the Schwarzschild and after a certain radius, uh, Freeman Robertson Walker. But that's a solution of the Einstein equations. That's an exact solution to the Einstein equations. So it's a modeling question. And you are saying your way of modeling the system is more accurate than the Einstein Strauss solution? Uh, what, what I'm claiming is that is, is a different way of modeling, which is essentially what is, I mean, in the end, the Zvachi, the Sitter, for example, will show the same effect that I'm discussing here. And also that is, is an excess solution. Uh, the vacuum solution of Einstein is actually uh, joining together an interior Zvachi and an exterior free of worker. So in, this, in a certain sense, no, it's an ex exterior yeah. Schwarzschild joining, an exterior Schwarzschild joining You're a Friedman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're joining, yeah, yeah. You're joining an, an exterior Svarchi solution with the free of Walker. So in that sense, it's, it's more artificial. Okay. 
but is there I'm a justification then for this way of modeling because because we we know that that galaxies have sort of detached from the hubble flow so any yeah. local yeah. effect of the hubble i would imagine can only come from the cosmological constant but not from from the actual expansion well again that would be again uh for example, is Vachia Sita, you would be right. There, there would be all the cosmological constant, but Vachia Sita is also a particular case of McVitie. Okay. But yes, I mean, you're right. It's, it's, it's a question of how we model the stuff. We model it with this melted solution that essentially take together, uh, well, find a, a solution like McVitie, but if you go with the Einstein uh, Strauss model, then by construction, you don't have any effect locally. Right. Thank you, uh, Michael, for your question. And let's uh, thank Alessio again. Thank you very much.